You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. It's ridiculous. I I didn't think we'd get something like that, but that, yeah. I know people, you know, we've had cards in the past. We had Scour, we had Endless Winter, Dimensional we had Crossroads. <laughs> Dimensional Crossroads. <laughs> this is, this blows them all out. Of the- Funny enough, we played our preview card, the Pro Tour, didn't we? I actually only just clicked that the other day, but this card is, um, this card is actually legitimately very spicy. <laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty much the opposite of what we've gotten before. We've gotten a lot of like toolbox cards before, like very, uh, very specific yeah very specific kind of spicy it's like <laughs> this could break the format or it could suck um i mean that's mostly defensive crosses but this one oh my god I, I opened it and i was like uh all right this is uh this is this this card will actually change the game which is incredible um all right episode 59 team calling blitz on the horizon sydney madrid vegas we're gonna be breaking down the format talking about our preparation and how we plan to win two events <laughs> But anyway, Hayden, talk to me about your week in flesh and blood. You've been taking a break, relaxing, chilling by the beach. No, not at all. No, no I've I've uh, I've been away for work for the last couple of days. It's been pretty full on, pretty busy, just catching up post getting back from the pro tour. You know, you take those those four, five, six days, and then there's just a bit of catch up to be done. But uh, still been playing some flesh and blood. Started to get into some blitz this week. Um, have kind of put down class constructed now. We'll probably play some pro quest this weekend though. But yeah, just now starting to think about Blitz and just trying out the format and revisiting it post post the changes, post the straight hitting Living Legend. Um, and it's, yeah, we're going to talk about it, but it's interesting. So that's kind of been my week in Flesh and Blood. I was trying to get to an armory or something this week because um, I haven't been to one in a while, but I couldn't make it. So yeah, looking to hopefully get to one next week. You, yourself, you know, what about you? You've been lounging by the sun or under the sun rather? Uh, not too much lounging. Um, I have been playing a little bit actually. We've just been trying to get ahead of it on Blitz, um, but I have no, haven't had too many people to play with. Uh, you know, like Sasha in particular has taken time off, so I know we're going to be hitting the ground running this coming week. Week, week, yeah. week. No, yeah. <laughs> um, but I did get to, and this is not flesh and blood, I, get, I did get to go on a, on a mountain bike ride today, which I haven't done for about six months. So there's like this trail near me, and uh, it was flooded for about Got like four months, then I had some health stuff, and um, yeah, I just finally got out there. And I, I feel like I, I feel like I died. I died like one of my nine deaths today. It's like ninety degrees, um, and oh my god! I, I there was a point. There was a point. I got back to my car, and I, I actually like you know th- it was getting a little little tunnel vision. Um, uh, I was seeing some of the uh, you know little floaters, and I was just like, man, I could just sit down. This will be it. But I really. I had to come back and do this podcast. That that it's it's that sounds dramatic. Motivating that, factor. That actually went through my mind. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> um You you yeah. also you apart from you know using one of your nine lives, it's just, you are kind of cat like sometimes, I think. Um you were uh, you you did play some flesh and blood this week on camera on oh. Team Covenant stream, you know. You yeah. were on the what happened there? Yeah, so um you know, just playing with my my teammate in the Blitz, the upcoming Blitz calling, Steven. Um, I don't know if that's public info yet, but he, he's decided to actually leave Team Covenant um, as a business, and he's come, you know, he's coming, he's come over to our side, and I think you know we're gonna dunk on, dunk on the Wolf Pack, the uh, woohoo, domesticate them. Um, nah, uh, unfortunately, I don't think Steven will be playing with us, but I got to join them for a sh- uh, join Steven for a stream because Zach actually went to this Star Wars thing in Disneyland. I think he's been waiting like two years to go to it too. Uh, I'm sure there's people listening that uh, that went to it as well. Um, but I got to hop on, play some games with Steven. We played some Blitz. Um, I brought four decks. I got to play Reinar into him, Chain, and Kano. Um, a very silly Kano deck, like Talismanic Lens, Cindering Foresight. It's like kind of tempo-y. Don't recommend it, but it led to some funny, some funny situations on stream with me trying to explain the strategies that you would uh, employ against Kano as whatever deck. You know, there's like the the part where, um, you know, you pitch cards, you play it safe, you block on hit triggers, or you just you just give it to him. And I remember the as soon as I told Steven about that, he tried the next game. He tried to just like pump me on one of his like uh, I would first. It was hit turn. He tried. He had lethal. He had something ridiculous. And I just hit him for like a million. And I was like, uh, <laughs> maybe bad advice. 
Well, good. I, I checked out a little bit of it, but if you haven't seen it, you can go YouTube, you know, and um, look up Team Covenant and their streams are always there. Weekly streams on Team Covenant where they cover Flesh and Blood. They also cover a lot of other games uh, if you are interested in what they do. I mean, Zach and Steven do an amazing job, so make sure to go check them out. And obviously, you can see Brendan uh, making the invasion this week and playing some some fab with Steven. So I know Steven will be in Vegas, right? I think he is teaming with Zach and they've got a, a Team Covenant team for the Vegas calling. Yep, they do. Um I have to mention that 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 meme that uh, showed up on Discord actually. Uh, I mean, I, I laughed out loud in public when I saw it. It's like the meme from the one like, I sent you. God, yeah, uh, yeah, the one. Well, technically, I saw it before you sent it to me. But the oh, God, what is that movie? Uh, the Tom Hanks movie where they're in Somalia. He's like, I'm the captain now. Um, oh yeah, it's the oh that one. I, there was a lot of memes coming out, but that was that's the one from um, Captain Phillips. Yeah, it's like I'm on I'm Team Covenant now. <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> Oh God, it's so funny. Uh, anyway, Hayden, what's uh, what's on what's on the news this week? So much. I mean, a lot's happening in the world of flesh and blood right now. We've just kind of closed out New Jersey. We've closed out the Pro Tour and the Calling, and things just keep rolling. We've got uprising previews starting uh, next week, right? I think the the fourth or the sixth is like the start of the preview season. So the sixth, which is the Monday, so a week and a bit till preview season starts, uh, but coming out very quickly. So. Uprising World Premiere, you talked about the top of the show. Obviously, we're going to talk about Team Blitz calling today. Um, we're excited to see people. I'm going to be in Sydney, of course. Brendan, you're going to be in Vegas. Uh, looking forward to playing, looking forward to being in the Uprising World Premiere and um, catching up with people. So other than that, our preview card, we talked about it at the top of the show. We're kind of chatting it as we chatting about it as we started the show, is that uh, we have a very, very spicy card, a very cool card. When you, when you told me what we had, Brendan, I was like, no way. I thought you were like pulling my chain. But I was like, how else would you have this card in your hand? So uh, we drop our preview on Monday, June 6th, uh, Eastern Standard Time. We'll be about 7 p.m. Eastern Standard, I think. Um, but we will we'll let you know in next week's pod uh, because we're probably going to record something in the next week because I think, I think we've got to do something special for this one, Brendan. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure to get it up. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be one of the, um, one of the most played cards uh, moving forward in Lush and Blood. It's, mm, it's, I think it's fair to say a staple is a, a term you could throw around with this card. Mm, yes. Yeah, people are going to say that we're memeing because, you know, in the past we've said, you know, we've had like a quite powerful card and people have said, you know, I saw something on like a, someone sent me a thing from like a Discord screenshot and I was like, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure someone said Dreadball was like this power level last time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people uh, like to hype up their spoilers, but... Um, yeah, Memorial Ground. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I mean... That could be the most busted card in the game. I heard it's really good for Ranger. Um, yeah, I think that this this time people won't be disappointed. It's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Moving on, the Elo ranking has been updated post New Jersey. We have a, a new world number one in Pablo Pinto, who is also our Pro Tour number one champion. Uh, see some very familiar names in the top ten there. We've got Michael Hamilton coming at number six, Matt at number eight, Michael being dethroned for now. Uh, you know. And uh, Sasha at number ten. Really interesting. The the kind of like the massive swings because of the <laughs> like K value. If you don't know how the Elo system works, uh, you can go and check out. There's an article when they from FabTCG.com when they updated the Elo system. But basically, the the higher the event, the the more I guess uh, Elo is won and lost during these games. So we've had you know pretty I guess when it comes to Elo middling events with callings and um so far and some battle hardens that have now been elo rated but now we get to the pro tour and it's like double what you have for a calling so it's really swingy um i think i finished up in 26th so about i think a little bit about where i was previously uh no 26 16th i don't know where that came from um and uh brendan and i did see you took a bit of a a bit of a hit i went three four right three four yeah i lost 106 elo yeah. that's a lot Took me about a it's year. A it took me about a year to get 160 ELO. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a lot. I mean, obviously, I I didn't do well, so I, I wasn't expecting to have a uh, wake up to good news when they updated the ELO. That's a big swing, though. That, that's a that's a big swing, considering that you know winning a calling is around, or at least obviously K values is going to make this always different. But in like the case of Michael Hamilton, he won about 60 to 70 ELO for winning the previous calling. Um, I know I got, by going 9-3, I got about uh, 55 ELO. So yeah, for going um, for going one game under even to lose 106 ELO, that, that's pretty incredible. Um, and yeah, that, that's, uh, 
it's a bit demotivating for elo obviously doesn't mean anything right now i don't know if it ever will uh we we theorize that it will because it'd be a silly system if it didn't but uh yeah i know there was there was a lot of players who did better than i did right you know three four is is you know, mm-hmm. didn't make day two but what they were positive and they lost you know 50 70 stuff like that so it's a it's a lot it's um it's funny because you know we've been talked about when will the elo system to be used and i think there's been some debate about the use of XP system, and now you see just how swingy this ELO system can be at the high level. And now it's like uh, maybe we need a little bit more time before we start <laughs> using this ELO system for for qualifications and invites. Just based on the fact that one pro tour can massively change your one event, one weekend can massively um, swing and skew it. Especially when you've got players coming in with that base ELO rating, because you know maybe they've come through the pro quest system, haven't had a chance to play a rated event before. Um, and then, you know, that brings new ELO into it, but also you've got a lot of discrepancy between levels. So I think they're just waiting for ELO to get into the system. They're waiting for pure numbers, pure points of, of ELO to get into the system. And then um, I think as we move forward, Pro Tour number two, more callings. Of course, you've got the Battle Hardens, Pro Quest, Road to Nationals now awarding ELO, albeit at a lower K value. You're just getting more ELO into the system. So, um, yeah, re- really interesting. I think we'll we'll see it be, of course, used in the future as we've talked about. But I think an event like this just shows where we're at with the ELO system and, and how maybe we need a, a little bit more time with it. So we'll, uh, we'll see. <laughs> um, Brendan. Today is May 27th as we record and as we release this actually. We're, we're recording late today, so the podcast is actually going to probably drop a couple of hours later than you usually would. Classic Battles is out. Ryan Arvis, um, a Perfect product for getting a friend, um, someone you know into the game at the game store. I think I think this product is like, this is the first proper introductory product from Flesh and Blood. You know, we had the the Hero decks back in Welcome to Wraith. We've had the Blitz decks come out, but this is really like, this is, you can see if you haven't already, um, you can go and see some like unboxings and stuff and the cards that are in this. This is very baseline. This is a great introductory product to teach people the game. Um, it comes with all the things you need, the two Blitz decks plus this and that, and has these these cool, you know, um, four heroes and whatnot and a few Majestics sprinkled in there. And I, th- I think this is just a, you know, a great way to get someone into the game, to pull someone in and I'm glad that we finally got a proper introductory product and I hope we see more of this going forward. But already I've heard, you know, people are seeing this and asking how to get into the game or, um, you know, is this a good starting point? What's a good starting point? Well, now I feel I can actually recommend people this uh, this Classic Battles sort of, you know, these dual decks because I think in the past it was, you know, if someone wanted to learn the game, I actually taught someone to play the game the other day using Tales of Aria Blitz decks and that's really hard. <laughs> There's so many mechanics. So I think um, I'm really glad to see these Classic Battles come about. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Like, how do you teach someone to play the game? Um, I think I've been teaching my brother off and on for almost uh, two years here, and he just can't get past the Ira the Ira Blitz decks. It's like as soon as we pick up the uh, so good as soon as we as soon as we pick up the tails, he's like, oh, there's just too much going on. I just can't do this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll have to check it out. I wonder if it's fun for like established players too, because I know. Like the Ira decks, those are incredible. Like those are fun. I could play that. I could play that against you right now, Hayden, and we probably have a good time. A's. We could we could play for hours and hours. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll probably pick one up, check it out. Um, do you uh, the lore book or the lore thing? It's just a pamphlet, right? It's not a book. Yeah, it is, but it's a it's a cool little insert addition to the pack. I haven't seen it. I didn't. I was meant to watch a, a box opening this morning. I just didn't get a chance. Um, but I'm gonna report back next week. So I'm gonna go and pick up a copy and uh and play with a friend who has played a little bit they you know they dabbled and um, i think this could be a way to get them back into it you know without the complex uh sort of mechanics of maybe some of the newer sets ease them into it so yeah i just hope we see more of these kind of products moving forward because i think as i say great way to get new players players who've dabbled a little bit people who want to get back into the game it's a really easy crack the box open shuffle the decks up and, and away you go yeah for sure all right so we got two weeks two more weeks of proquest have you participated? Yeah, you, you participated yet? I'm assuming no, right? I have not. I have not. So uh, there was very. I think there's only one or two pro quests here in Australia last weekend. Um, but there's for the next two weeks. There's there's heaps. <laughs> so mm. I do have the opportunity to go and play some. Definitely going to play one on Saturday. So tomorrow my time. Um, I haven't picked a deck. Haven't really thought about class constructor. I'll probably just play Dash. It was the deck I was you know lining up for the pro tour. Have just recorded a deck tech about it um and then you know maybe i have some fun you know i even thought about playing bolton but i just i don't know if i can bring myself to do it brendan uh, so yeah i mean oh god i wonder if we should break that down right now <laughs> this like we there's there's a, there's big memes on like uh how we ended up playing 
uh, a co- kind of a combo deck. Yeah, Kano is a combo deck, I guess. But oh, we, I talk so much trash about Bolton. Um, I, I actually had a deep think about this, to be honest. Oh, so I was like, I thought about it last night when I played a few games of Bolton, and I can explain it perfectly. But you, you go. <laughs> Well, so I know a lot of our I know a lot of our audience comes from like a Magic the Gathering background. So for me, like I see Kano more as like uh, let's talk Legacy too, as like an Elves deck where I see Bolton as more of like a reanimator deck that just like needs to hit their piece and if, once they hit it they win, but like I don't know. It's not there's not a lot of gameplay that goes into it, I don't feel. Where, you know, with Kano, like I feel like I'm actually playing the game, even though I'm I'm pushing myself to the situations. Less like I'm trying to just draw my cards. Um, I could be wrong, right? Maybe I haven't played enough Bolton combo, but uh, yeah, I think that there's there's something more cerebral about the about the Kano combo that draws me in. But who knows? I could be biased just due to the raw power. It's having played a few games last night with with Bolton Sabers combo. The 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 comparison or the difference, I guess, between that and like the Kano deck that is a combo deck that we played at the PT. It's just like pieces, like how, how it comes together. The Bolton combo is looking for an initial setup with cards and soul, and then it's looking <clears throat> to have these cards set up on a particular turn to enact the combo. So two to three, Lumina, a beacon of... Um, victory. Courage. V- victory, that's the one. Uh, and is it Beacon of Victory, is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay, and, and then uh, you know maybe an Oath of Steel as a replacement for one of the Luminas, depending on how you look at the combo. That's a lot of things that need to come together, and I think that's it can be disrupted easier because your cards are sitting in hand and on board and you do it on your turn. The thing with the Kano piece is like, there's a couple of pieces, you know, there's like the main piece is wildfire and then there's so many other things that can go into that. But also there's cards that find you wildfire. You do it on your opponent's turn. So I felt, I was like, you know, I want to go back to Bolton combo after playing Kano and just look at that and maybe think about playing it for a pro quest. And I was just really struggling with just like the amount of stuff. It's a different deck, I think. It's just like, it's, it's quite, it's quite different. Yeah. Um, in terms of like the thought process and the approach to it and uh yeah i just i think i thought maybe maybe you know maybe i haven't given enough because i have always d- basically hated playing the deck i've never enjoyed it i've enjoyed it a little bit more this time but yeah we're still really frustrated so i think um i think i won't be picking it up for but i can see why people like it like i can definitely see why people like it just not for me yeah i think that i think that i also just really enjoy drawing and an in- disgusting egregious like, disgusting amount of cards. Amount. yeah disgusting amount i like the opt nine where i'm like and i've got like my cards like this i'm like uh god i, I just love doing that also the can the thing about kano i just love that oh, you can win games that you shouldn't be winning right like mm. there's always this out because you have this uh this ability it's effectively pay three draw a card and then you have cards that you can i mean quote unquote draw that draw you more cards and then it's like you could there's always these like crazy lines and, that take you out yeah. yeah yeah but no so yeah two weeks of pro quest left uh you're playing one this weekend i'm playing one this weekend i think i'm gonna probably play dash do you know what you're gonna play i don't um i have chain ready to go um we were actually talking about this before we came on like mm. i we i tested a lot of chain into fatigue i, I I expect to get fatigue, basically. Um, I tested a lot of chain into fatigue in preparation for the Pro Tour. Um, we iterated on quite a few chain decks. Um, I feel very comfortable on the hero. That being said, like, you know, actually, this is a uh, little spoiler, but I think I talked about it on Twitter. We I had Tyler Horsepool on the um, for a deck tech, but it's Prism deck, um, yesterday, which is coming out, and mm-hmm. I think it's, like, next week. And uh, maybe he's convinced me to play Prism. Maybe I'll play some Prism. The only reason I wouldn't play Prism... I think this weekend is because for some reason my local meta has pretty much never played Starva. There's a few of them, but even when Starva was agreed, like, you know, in the past metas, like they were still on chain and Lexi and like, you know, some people were on prism, but um, yeah, just not a lot of Starva uh, in this, this specific area of Texas. Yeah, right. Well, there you go. If you're in Texas this weekend, pick up your Starvos. I guess that might help Brendan. Let's see. Depends what he plays. Uh, I did want to shout out as well to the team over in France, um, Pierre Canali and and his group of players. I think Christian Franco, who's the French national champion, have been doing the gauntlet. We did the ProQuest gauntlet season one. Brennan, you know, if you remember that, we did we did some games. We played some games. I think I lost all of them, so that was great. Uh, I feel really good about that. But now Pierre and and uh, his, I guess, group or they they've got a youtube channel go check it out uh do, do you know what it's called the the, the i have a video channel i <laughs> i have a video in french um um and they they make you take a picture with i have a video it's great i love it so much um i got to meet uh pierre at the pro tour just like one of the most lovely human beings and i was always a big fan of his from magic days so 
was nice to nice to meet him and um, and the group. But yeah, go check out. They've got two videos out now for the ProQuest Gauntlet. I think the first match was uh, what was the first match? It was Chain and Ultim, and now it's Kano and Briar. I think is the second match. So yeah, make sure to go go check it out and support uh, what they're doing with ProQuest Gauntlet season two. Other than that, Brennan, uh, we did a deck tech on the Kano build, of course. That's up on the YouTube channel. We did that last week. Sasha joined us for that. Uh, and, of course, there's a cyborg guide up on, on Patreon. We also did a massive deep dive video, right, Brennan? We did this hour long, actually, I think it's over an hour, uh, video deep dive talking about all the lines, the combo in depth, talking about the matchups, how to cyborg, how you're trying to play into those matchups. Um, and, I mean, you're a little bit biased here, Brennan, but I think it's an interesting video. I think it's a, you know, it really goes beyond the just the kind of the surface level of the deck tech that we did. So that is out there. And we've also got a dash, a dash deck tech, the dash deck that kind of, I guess I poured my heart and soul into, to be honest, for the Pro Tour and, and didn't end up playing. Um, but really enjoyable, I think, deck. I think is in a pretty pretty good position still. Um, so that's going to be up, I think, by the time this pod drops, it'll be up in about 12 to 24 hours. Plus, you've got the uh, the Cyborg Guide, of course, up on Patreon, as we always do for that. Yeah, and speaking of Patreon, you know, just a big shout out to everybody who is supporting us on Patreon. It does help a lot. We've seen a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of support um, since the PT, actually. So that's been incredible. Um, and we're just excited to kind of really dig, dig, uh, dig deep in, into content again. Um, you know, we're very busy heading into the heading into the pro tour, both with work and preparation. So now we get to finally sort of relax and get back to both gameplay, deck tags, deck guides, and maybe we'll do a little bit of more, uh, a little bit more coverage. Uh, <laughs> talk about the matches Love that to. I lost on. Well, we both lost matches on stream, so double the content. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> we suck. <laughs> oh my good. Well. Um, hey, we're back home, Australia, Texas. I know we've been here for a while, but it feels like you just got back because your work is so crazy. I think we should have a, cel- a celebratory, uh, celebratory cue. What do you think? Shrimps on the Barbie? Fire it up. Fire it up. <laughs> this week's question, the Commander Cookout, comes from um, Blagon on Twitter. This is actually a question I stole from our mailbag the other week. We didn't get through all of our, our mailbag questions, and we had some amazing questions, so I wanted to revisit some of these. And this one is a Twitter question, as they say. So, Brendan, the question this week for the Commander Cookout. To what extent do you think hyperpolarized matchups, 90-10 matchups, are an issue in the current state of Flesh and Blood? Also, if there is... A, yeah, wait, wait on, wait on. <laughs> also, if there is a time... If there is time, there is, don't worry. Also curious what you guys think will potentially fix this if you think it's an issue. So first of all, are hyperpolarized matchups an issue, Brendan? And if so, oh, do we God. need to solve them? How do we solve them? I got an answer. Oh, man. We talk about this a lot. This is like, um, I had a really deep conversation with Sasha about this on like our, our long drive back from the uh, the convention center because the traffic was so bad on that last day. Um, oh, it was awful. <laughs> yeah. So in Flesh and Blood... I, I'm going to make a quick point here because this this outside of kind of the scope of this conversation. But yeah, for about a year or so, uh, at least since Monarch, we've seen this like hyper aggressive and this polarization of this hyper defensive. And that's mostly been the meta and the hyper aggressive has been very much just sort of the premier aggro deck. And if you weren't on that, it was like, what were you doing? Um, and the middle has really suffered. <clears throat> that being said, I think that like one of the most unfun, unbalanced, and powerful heroes in the game is actually Old Him. And I li- I'm not saying Old Him is unfun to play. Like Old Him is fun to play, uh, particularly what you can do with the second cycle, which is not really an Old Him thing, but more of a crown of seeds thing, as you turbo there faster than your opponent. But Old Him is actually kept in place by Prism. But I think that it's that like I'm happy that exists right now. But I do think it's bad game design because this old old him having this this ten percent into, into prism and just getting completely blown out, not being able to deal with spectra, that's not fun. And I think we've talked about this podcast a lot. This idea of a rock paper scissors format. I think that that is the antithesis of flesh and blood. Going to a tournament and trying to gem format my my way past the you know the scissors because I'm taking the paper deck to prey on the rocks. Like I don't think that's actually fun. Like we can have a rock paper scissors format where it's just like yeah you have unfavorable matchups but you can play tight and you can maybe get a bit lucky and you get out of it. But in which when it's like truly this this um, this other deck just absolutely counters you because your deck doesn't have the tools to get past you know spectra you don't have the action points etc. I don't think that that's actually good game design um we see similar things with kind of like kano and a prism like kano like just can't interact with prism i know we got scour but i think that these you know while these sort of heroes uh and these polarized matchups are actually keeping the game in check right um and they feel good sometimes ultimately i think that they are poor game design and they will lead us down bad roads right like 
Um, so I, I am concerned to be honest. Uh, and I don't think that they should, should exist. What should we, <laughs> and I don't know if I should, I'm going to let you speak Hayden before I go on to the no, next no, part. No, actually, no, no. First of all, I think we should hear, how would you, how would you fix it? What would your approach be? Do you really want to hear this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But maybe like the, you know, okay. like a, this is a bridge version maybe if it's that big. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that Flesh and Blood is getting to a space, uh, getting to a point in the game where like design space is getting very limited. Um, <clears throat> you know, the easy the easy things to to sort of pick on are like how many more zero zero cost defense reactions can they print? How many more zero cost even attack actions can they print? How many you know X attack actions with this kind of hit trigger can they print? It's really starting to get limited. Um, you know, armor with high defense, there's etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and like I think that a part of that is you know these these design decisions and in, in things like prism, right. That just really, they, they corner, they corner game design, right. Because now you cannot have a hero that, that, that can't deal with the board state, right. Unless it's doing something egregiously overpowered, like Starva was where it could come over the top if it got lucky. And that's not fun either. So <clears throat> like my, my potential solution. And I actually, we're going to do a very deep, deep talk about this. And I encourage people to not wait till next week's pod to give us feedback because we're going to bring a very uh, a very concise and sort of breakdown argument of our thoughts around this. But I think that Flesh and Blood may be approaching a time when it should consider rotation only because of where, like, the limitations of game design and some... the Like, just look at the past metas. It's been a different flavor of the same thing for about a year. And a lot of this is happening because of fundamental things in the design that are just more powerful than others. And I think that we can learn lessons. We can rotate and the game can be fresher, right? Flesh and Blood has lost so many of its sort of core tenants recently, right? You know, one of the core tenants being low variance. Um, this idea of like your 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 pitch mattering or the the contents of your deck mattering past like you know what you, what you just draw in your hand and like that just becomes less and less and less. And like Starva was really the the cherry on top, right? We're just like with Starva, like nothing mattered. It was just the game was won in deck building, and then obviously kind of the draw as well. And I'm not taking anything away from Starvo players or Starvo mirrors. Like they were technical to an extent, but the hero ability itself, I feel like it broke all of the rules. It brought it broke everything that Flesh and Blood was designed to sort of be and what it was differentiating itself from. Um, so I want to I want to really dive into this topic, and it's it's not a negative thing too. I think that people have a knee jerk reaction to this as if it's like very negative, and I think that you know we should sort of keep an open mind, have a discussion and talk about what the game looks like if we did that, because it might be healthy. And I know there's games that have existed that have not rotated that have stayed eternal forever, but is that actually the right decision to make the best game? I don't know. Um, I know that they made the promise, you know, they told us that it wouldn't, but I, I'm starting to sort of mull over this topic a lot and consider the future. But um, yeah, I don't want, I want to like, I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to uh, overshadow this pod too much with that, but I think, uh, yeah, next week's pod, we're really going to be doing a deep dive on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I disagree with a lot of what you said, <laughs> which I think is the great thing about, I think, having, you know, uh, us too. We, we have a lot of different opinions, I think, Brendan, but one of the things, there's so much that you just said there, and I don't want to unpack too much of the rotating format versus non-rotating format. I think we can, like you say, leave that till next weekend. But if I talk about pure game design, some of the things you said, you said you feel like game design is starting to become very limited. I feel like the opposite. And I think that Uprising is going to show us that. I think we're already seeing hints of just where the game design can go with like the draconic talent and, and what we're about to see with this new set. And I think that's going to pump a bit of life into, I guess, the idea of the game design and where it is right now. But I think overall, like I kind of, yeah, I kind of don't really agree with that. Like you talked about how many more zero cost defense reactions and stuff can they print? Well, why, why do they need to print anymore? What, like why why did why do defense reactions need to be where do the game design goes why what if the defense reactions are kind of fleshed out we've seen 80% of the defense reactions we're going to see in this game and we move on to other spaces of game design if, there is other spaces of game design that are less touched right there's other elements of the the deck you know if you said in arcane rising people in arcane rising said that, that you know the game design is starting to reach its limits do you know what i mean like and then we see talented heroes and we see the use of the soul and the banish zone in monarch and then we move through and we see um the the elemental talent system in tales of aria and, and this just keeps going and going and i think there's a real clear i think one of the things i got from james white when he did the q a and just the things he said um sort of over the new jersey weekend and, and outside of that 
is that there is a, a pretty clear roadmap for at least the areas of game design that he wants to explore and the areas of game design that he had explored prior to even publishing starting, you know, in terms of what he had fleshed out with this world um, that he has. So I'm pretty optimistic about the game design space. I will agree with you on things like Star of the Show. Uh, I think I think those break the tenets of the game, but not so much because of, like, my understanding is that that hero was not pre-planned. Do you know what I mean? In terms of, like... <laughs> Where that came about in the design space, yes, they were had always looked at bringing heroes in and giving them that kind of treatment. Uh, they need to look at that, right? I don't disagree with that, but I don't think that's necessarily, I guess, um, indicative of where game design and the design space is. Now, I want to get back to the original question, the first part of this about 90-10 matchups, because you think you were saying you think they keep things in check, but they're kind of a failure of game design and not good for the game, right? Is that kind of, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to Yeah, yeah, no, that, 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 that is definitely, that is definitely what I said. Okay, okay. I, yeah, I disagree. <laughs> I basically think that having hyperpolarized matchups is good for a meta. I think this is how you, like you say, you keep metas in check and I think it's really important to have it. I think it's bad if it continues. So if, if say, um, and this is one, maybe one design element that I'm a little bit worried about is like, you touched on a little bit, but if Kano is always bad into Prism, right? Because it can't interact, then that's bad for the game, right? But I felt, like, if you use that as an example, I felt that Kano's matchup into Prism in this current meta wasn't actually that atrocious because of cards like Scour, because of the power of what your deck could do in a linear fashion. Um, you talk about Ultim versus Prism, right? I think those things are really necessary. I think they, like, they attract people to the game in terms of, like, the fact that you know that, hey, you really hate this deck and what it does. You really hate playing into Ultim and just being ground out every single game. Here's an option for you to play. Like I think that is actually really good for getting players into the game, building out a meta, building out a format, and basically, yeah, just encouraging players to to have that that ability. Do I think it's the perfect solution? No, but I don't think there's any perfect solution in this. I think if every matchup was somewhere between 50 and 60%, quote-unquote, based on skill, based on variance, based on draw, etc., I don't know if I'd enjoy that game, to be honest. I feel like coming into a meta, going to an event and picking a deck becomes so much more arbitrary as opposed to, and it comes about like, what are you a specialist in? What do you, uh, what do you, like, what do you enjoy playing as opposed to like, I'm really going to dive into this and find out like the fundamentals of a hero and the way I can try and like attack this meta. I think that's way more interesting. And people can probably disagree with me and say that that's not, that's not a great way to approach a game. That's personally what I really like about Flesh and Blood. That's what I've liked about all the events and all the formats we've played so far as it felt like you could try and understand the format, work on sort of like what the tenets of that meta is and then try and attack it with a certain thing, whether it be a Kano, whether it be Chain, whether it be Briar, whatever it is, whether it be, you know, Viscerai. Like these are the things that, that interest me. And I think if you take away from these like kind of polarized matchups, you stop checking things and then more heroes become playable. I don't think having every hero be playable in a meta is a good thing. That's kind of my bottom line, I think. I think heroes should cycle in and out of playability and be stronger in, in certain metas and as the meta evolves over a season. You know, we just saw a, a, a format with the Pro Tour where we saw more Kano. Okay, what does that mean? Does that mean like Prism gets a bit of resurgence? Does that mean that decks that can play well with Arcane Barrier, maybe like a, a Briar or some, you know, like a, a Reinar become like more, more playable? Like those are the things I want to see as opposed to just every hero be kind of playable, but some only have 40% matchups, some have 60% matchups. Because that's what I'd be worried about is like, that's kind of how I felt we've had some formats in the past of like, you get these rune blades that are just like, just better than everything else. But then I wanted, like, I think some of these polarized matchups help check that. And that's kind of, you know, like ultimate to Lightning Briar and, and uh, the Tales of Ari format, like those kind of things are things I want to see. So yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> well, I agree with one thing you said about the heroes rotating. <clears throat> That's definitely, that's definitely on my right. So there's, there's just one distinction. That's that, you know, game design and its effect on gameplay are not totally synonymous, right? Like they can design, there, there's a, there can be a lot of room for like adorable game design, but if it has virtually no effect on the game because they've, you know, certain heroes have, are just fundamentally stronger or, you know, it's either the chain or it's the aggro decks or it's the ultra defensive decks that are old him. And then you, you're printing all these heroes that are having little effect. Maybe they're doing cute stuff. Um, I don't know if that, that's like, that's the only thing I'm worried about is, is, is sure it? me too me too <laughs> but getting to your point though is like um and it's important because that that's definitely going to be a distinction between that you're going to hold and I'm I'm assuming that some people won't is that you enjoy the aspect of like non-interactive um sort of matchups right these matchups well non-interactive is like as old him there's like virtually nothing you can do right you compare it into the prism it's like just the way that the, that class has been designed and spectra as a keyword your your card pool can't really deal with it um 
Kano, right? Like Kano and Aura. It's like, yes, of course you can beat, you could beat Kano. I'm not saying you couldn't beat Kano's prism, but it was just like the fact that you couldn't interact. It was, it, it's annoying, right? Um, and I don't, for me, I don't think that that's good game design. Is it, but that's where, that's where I'm sort of having this self dialogue. It's like, maybe it's not good game design, but my question is, is it good for the game? Um, and that's really, that's really the sort of the fundamental that I'm, I don't really think I have an answer for yet. And that's sort of where this, uh, this sort of this, these thoughts are coming from. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, flesh and blood is in a really interesting state. You know, we've just, we've, I think that looking back on the game since Monarch, like, it's been it's been it's been different right like uh, a lot of things have changed and a lot of things have stayed the same right um you know particularly with you know your change your priors your viscerize and of course the other participation in those medals which have been like old hymns and then prism has found its ability to compete as well um both as a defensive deck but mostly as a deck that preys on these sort of guardians and um uh, another sort of control decks i guess but uh yeah we'll crack it open next week and uh i just want to say one more thing Brendan, because i don't want to be mis misunderstood about the the point about polarized matchups and, and interactive gameplay because you just talked about ultim versus prism right i think there are builds in certain metas where it's 90 10 sure i don't think the heroes into each other uh, are 90 10 and i think that's a really important thing about flesh and blood is that you have the ability with your heroes to do a range of different things you say the card pool is not there for ultim to to at least be favorable into prism i would agree with that but i don't think it means that it can't compete like there are ways to build Ultim to compete into Prism. Yes, you have to give up other things. And that's the that's the the conundrum, right? That's the thing that I think is so beautiful about the game of Flesh and Blood is that it's literally what we prayed on at the PT is people not having enough space to put Arcane Barrier into the deck because they had to deal with, you know, start of the show had to deal with Prism and it had to deal with Chain. Like these are the things that I think are super interesting. Yes, Ultim maybe can never get to 60% against Prism in a, you know, in a, a matchup space, right? But it can probably get to 30 or 40%. And I think that's an important distinction, right, of what these heroes can do. And I just think that is why I don't have a problem with the game design at the moment. I don't have the same concerns you do, I think, and why I think is actually a good thing for the game. So, mm. yeah, it's the thing. It's like it, it's it's like I'm not sure if I have a problem, but I'm starting to I'm starting to think a lot, right? And I wanna I wanna sort of I wanna talk with people, right? I, I wanna figure out and, and look at like past examples and just see where we're going and and just try to understand the landscape a bit more. Um, one and I, I don't I don't have the answer too. Uh, I'm not I don't think I don't know if I'm right. I don't know if I'm not right. Like I just want to break it down. One thing about the Kano deck in the PT in the PT, I think that you can say like uh, like yes, it is a valid statement to say that it was a meta call because people weren't packing AB, they weren't ready for it, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think that Kano's success for the most part comes down to the fact that Wildfire is not a very balanced card. And like, I don't think that, like that was really, that was the crux. Like, I think that if Wildfire didn't exist, we wouldn't have brought Kano, right? Like it's obviously people were cutting their AB, they were getting very greedy, but this deck can beat AB. It's not ideal, but uh, at the end of the day, it was, it, it's Wildfire. Like Wildfire, oh. is, wildfire is, was, wildfire was the thing that I felt like we were exploiting. Um, but uh, I point you towards Alexander Vore. His deck was designed, I think, less to exploit wildfire Absolutely, and more to exploit yeah. low arcane barrier. So I, I get what you're saying. I agree. I agree on wildfire, right? That's one of the reasons to play that deck. But I guess my point is that, you know, you walk into the meta with Kano this weekend, it's going to be way harder for you because the meta adjusts. And that's not game design related. That's the fact that those tools are there. And that's, I mean, it is kind of game design, but it's related to players being able to adapt and to adjust and to have the tools to do so. And not just be like, well, I can't beat Kano, you know, or yeah. I can't beat. Prism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Like that um that concept of like, well, I can't I can't be Kano, um, is just gonna be a loss for me. Like I, I I'm happy that that's not a thing. And uh mm -hmm. I think it kind of points back to like some of the things we were just talking about. Nevertheless, we digress. <laughs> um yep. if, if you just want to say if you want to get your questions in for the commander cookout, you can do it whatever way. I got a note at the PT, Brendan, and I was really excited <laughs> hoping it was a, a commander cookout question. It was not. It just said a little note. So you know who you are who passed that to me. I'm pretty sure Brendan encouraged that. If you do want to get your questions in, email to arsenalpassfab at gmail.com, tweet them at us, uh, DM us, drop them in the comments below. Let us know that they are for Commander Cookout. If you're part of our Discord, community Discord through our Patreon, then uh, drop them in the channel there as well. We do get a lot there. So, yeah. Where to next, Brendan? On to the main topic of the pod. Uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking about Blitz, right? Um, first thing I want to start off is, let's just like break it down. Uh, there's, there's an elephant in the room. 
And Hayden, I gotta ask you, is Blitz as bad as people say it is? I'm gonna have the same opinion that I had last time when we talked. So I guess this is maybe a bit of a differentiation between our last Blitz pod. We talked about Blitz prior to the last skirmish season or just as the last skirmish season started. We're gonna talk about Blitz now, right, Brennan, with the changes with the mm-hmm. ban and suspended update plus Viscerai Living Legend, which is, I think, really important for this format, but also through the context and the lens of a team Blitz calling coming up, right, with the three callings around the world. Uh, do I think Blitz is as bad as people say? Well, I, do people say it's bad anymore? I, I don't know. I, I guess I would like to hear people's thoughts in the comments, to be honest. Let us, like, what do you think of the current state of Blitz past Viscerai hitting Living Legend and the ban and suspended changes? Because I think there was, you know, Krakow, Viscerai dominated. People felt the format was pretty bad. I've always felt that the format is, well, not always, but recently I felt the format has been at least quite quite fun, quite enjoyable to play in small amounts, and I like that the, the games are short. I also still think it's a good format for, for newer players just because you don't have to worry about sideboarding and, and strategies can be a bit more linear in terms of like you just, this is my deck does this thing, um, which I think is, is good for the game, and it's short, it's easy to run for armories, etc. But in saying that, my, my experience so far with the, the first few weeks of this, or I guess this week of change with the band spend announcement looking towards the calling is that format seems like quite quite a bit of fun. Like there's a lot of things you can play. There's um, there's, there's decks that have, I think previously were kind of unplayable with Viscerai. I mean, they just kind of dominate the format. It doesn't feel as domineering as it did, which, yeah. If people say it's bad, interested to hear, but I've not heard that as much, Brendan. Yeah, I guess it depends on the company you keep. Um, <clears throat> so I- True. I like I, I like Blitz. Um, I think the format's healthier right now. Uh, I mean, if you look at the results of the um, what they call them battle hardens these days, the battle hardened in New yeah, Jersey look pretty, yeah, it might not look like healthy format. Look pretty miserable, but I don't think that that's a. I don't honestly, and I think it's it's potentially incorrect and borderline arrogant for me to say, but I don't think that that's a very good representation of the format. Not because there wasn't a lot of people there, it wasn't a, or it wasn't a relevant tournament. It's just like. I don't know. I, I tested. I, I've tested now. Like I, I played against those decks. I, I've played some other decks into those. De- and I'm just. I'm. I'm surprised that that many old hymns floated to the top. Like I really am. Um, so I, I think that the format is more wide open than it appears to be based off the top eight results um, of that tournament. I walked the top tables at the Battle Harden because I we we didn't really do anything on the Sunday other than sort of. Uh, help Sasha do some testing and working out what matchups might look like and we did some team drafts on the Sunday but the battle harden was going on it was 10 rounds it was a massive battle harden it's the biggest battle harden they've ever had uh, and I walked around a, a few rounds I think I walked around about round 5 and I walked around round 9 I think so the the penultimate round before mm-hmm. the top 8 cut there was a lot more than Oldham's around yes there was a lot of Oldham's around but there was a lot of Reinars around there was a lot of Briars around um, there was like actually like I would say the top sort of like 20 tables there was like a reasonable amount of diversity but like then you hit the next like 10 to 15 tables there's quite a lot of diversity there was like dashes around there was chains around like there was there was a lot of different stuff there was canos around so i was quite interested about the how the top eight cut ended up falling i wasn't expecting that because i saw more than just ultims sitting around those top tables but i think what happened in week one is something similar to happens in week one in a lot of formats is that a very linear strategy that wants to do one thing with a single in mind that can really be tough if you don't know how to deal with it and when decks are a little bit like loose not as tuned prevailed so this idea that there's an ultimate deck that can really like just grind you out can fatigue you out can just like soak up all your damage and then because it's a 40 card format and then just win the game that way i think that prevailed because of this new format decks just weren't as tuned people weren't able to find their damage as well um and then you know you have decks like this that just do well i I honestly think that's why we saw ultim do so well in in week one of, of this new blitz format the Ultim deck that won that tournament is an enigma to me, to be honest. Um, it is great, cool, amazing, medical. Yeah, so this is like mono defense reactions, but it does have Oak and Old. Um, like, how does that deck beat a Reinar? That like, I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like it puts out that much damage, right? So don't you just stack your Barrage beatdowns and play an Alpha Rampage, or not even? And it's just a uh, OTK. Uh, and every Reinar, de- most Reinar decks have that package. And then I think, like, I'm surprised the Kano's lost to that. I, I genuinely am. So I, I, we did some testing into it. Um, and I'm surprised that the Kano's were losing to that build. Because the thing about Kano is, like, there's two ways of approaching it. Or, not there's two ways of approaching it. I said it too much. But, you know, 
you look at like how to shut down Kano and of course having Arcane Barrier and being always ready, always good to pitch for it. Like that's good. Um, it's definitely, it, it affects his, his play. But if you're at the same time applying no pressure and you give a Kano full agency to set up, I mean, I feel like it's one of the most inevitable, <laughs> inevitable decks in the game, right? Um, can just stack some ridiculous cards. Uh, it, even nowadays with the with the wildfire and stuff, it feels like you don't even have to deck stack, which is incredible. Uh, I could see though, you're playing like Chain, you're playing Briar, like yeah, that that ultimate deck might dunk on you. <laughs> like it'd be tough. Yeah, I just think that's that's what happened in week one, and I think great great shout to to play ultimate. I think. It was like the deck to to play and to beat coming into the battle hard. It got, I guess, like yeah, it got touched by awakening, but it was already quite powerful and it has this ability to. Uh, I think in a forty card format, and we saw this, you know, previously, is that you have to really understand where your damage is going to come from because you, you know, you can run out of cards. And yes, you have twenty life, you have half the health you do, but equipment still defends for two. Mm -hmm. Like the ratio, the percentage of like equipment is higher in that game. You know, the the percentage of your defense reactions is higher uh, of your starting life. So it's um. Yeah, I think really interesting. And I think at the end of the day, a good medical. But where to next? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's my question. You kind of mentioned you kind of mentioned earlier, and I just want to circle back to this. But in the in the opinion of Hayden Dale, is the format better after the bans? Yeah, I think so. I, I think I think it can't be not better. Uh, <laughs> I, so I thought the format was like pretty reasonable. But like once these viscerai decks got tuned, like it was pretty ridiculous. I think like when we did the last blitz, the blitz pod, I felt the format was actually all right. And then these viscerai decks started to get really tuned, and then it was not okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's basically how I feel. To be fair, looking at that top, if I hadn't been testing and I just looked at that top eight, I would have been, I would have been like, oh my god, this format looks like it sucks, right? This is one of the mono yeah. fatigue decks playing into each other. Fair enough. Yeah. So I don't believe that that's it, but uh, yeah, I do also think that it's going to be a healthier format. Um, unfortunately for all of you Kasai players who hopelessly still sleeve up that deck, I don't think you're going to have a place in this meta. Um, but a lot of other decks are going to be pretty viable. Um, I just want to. Like so, we get rid of, we get rid of Viscera, right? We have we get a nerf on Kano. It's a mm. sign, it's a significant nerf. It's a significant nerf. It's like sure, a significant sure. nerf. Um, but is he still viable? Probably. Um, we can kind of break him down a little bit more. Old him, technically. I mean, so old him. Where do you think that is right now? Do you think that is the de facto best deck in the format? I, obviously, people thought it was. A lot of people brought it, did really well with it in New Jersey. But mm. you know, looking towards Sydney, your upcoming event. Do you think that old him is the best deck? Do you think that every team will have an old him on it? I don't know if I think it's the best deck. I don't know what the best deck is right now. I think it's the deck to beat, and I think it's the deck that you kind of default to, I think, and it's probably going to be on over 80% of teams are going to have an ultim on there because I think it makes sense to, and I think you're going to struggle to find three better decks that attack whatever you think the meta is. Attacking a Blitz meta is way harder than attacking a Classic Constructed meta, I think, because you don't have sideboards, so like linear strategies in general like you just like finding the best linear strategies or ways to play into linear strategies are really important so trying to like trying to metagame it is tough especially when you've got team events coming up you know people want maybe want to play things they're more familiar with etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah i i think um i think the ultim is like the the one to the one to play the the way to go for sure do you think it's still uh do you think the blitz is still a tur uh, a two-turn format or has it slowed down no i think it has slowed down i, I mean i think it can be a two-turn format for sure you've got You've got decks like Reinar, Kano can still do it. You've got, um, you know, a Briar, you know, start with Channel Maharok and play, come in with like a 30 damage turn pretty easily. Like, you can still have KO. <laughs> KO can do it. You've still got two turn decks in this format, but I think that the format isn't just a strictly like, because of the dominance of Viscerai and the fact that that was just like a straight up turn two deck in, in the last format and you were trying to race it or try and come up with a solution to disrupt it immediately. Um, I think you can move away from that and you can look at other, other strategies of viable now. You talked about Kasai, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think Kasai is necessarily completely unviable. I don't like the way that people are building Kasai right now, but my advice would be go away and look at Kasai in a different light. Like how else could you play Kasai? You know that the the, dam the pure damage output of Kasai is, is not as strong as other heroes. So what other strengths can you play into? Valiant Dynamo is a really powerful card, right? Yeah, so Blood, on, Blood hands on a hand is a powerful hands, card. Yeah. It's like there's, yeah, there's like, like two broken cards. Like just build your freaking deck around that. I don't understand why people are playing aggro Kasai. Like maybe I'm wrong, but I just, when I see that deck, I'm like, okay, you're an aggro deck, but you're just worse than every other aggro deck. And you're trying to play fair, fresh and blood. Like your boots equipment is decently unflare. Eh, sorry, un unflare. Unfair. Unfair. And then your your specialization is 
ridiculous. Um, and it totally supports it, like a control deck or at least a value oriented deck that is trying to generate copper and then have these big turns. Um, yeah, I also agree with you that Kasai is potentially being built incorrectly. Yeah, no, I just I would just say that that's my advice. If you want to play Kasai, is just maybe go back to the drawing board and, and discard what you think a Kasai deck looks like and, and maybe just kind of start from from scratch and think about the format and, and how to attack it. Like is is consistent sort of fourteen damage turns the way you want to play into Ultim, for instance, you know? Or is there other ways to play into the deck? So yeah, I mean, in terms of the format after the ban, yeah, I think Ultim is like you say, it's kind of the default, like the target on its back, the one you need to look at, the one you need that's probably gonna define the callings, I think, Ultim's still going to define the callings, whether that be people finding ways to beat it consistently or people just refining the Ultim deck to be the best deck in the format. That's, I think, going to be the question. But then outside of that, I think there's a lot of, like, decks that, that are sitting around that are options, right? And I think you want to you wanna talk about some of these? Mm-hmm. Let me ask you first, though, before we go into it. Sure. You got to lock your team tomorrow. Mm. You pick all the decks. What three heroes are you bringing? Oh, interesting. I mean, I've only started with a couple of things in testing, so... I'd probably default to like what people know and have played and feels good so far. I think we'd probably still have an Ultim at this point. Uh, I think it's just, it's probably too good into the field to not have one right now. Uh, that could change. Um, probably an aggro deck of some sort, maybe Briar or Chain, and then probably something like a Kano. I, th I think Kano is still, like we saw Mark Johnson um, come second in the Battle Harden with Kano. Like Kano is still definitely viable so no, might be Reinhard, the three that I'd, I'd pick up yeah like reinar might be like it'd be like maybe reinar or an aggro deck like a briar or something could be the option i think reinar's still really good yeah i did actually just forget about reinar for a second yeah um i guess i'll answer you? the question as well <laughs> yeah please it's mostly a question of do i bring the old him or not because i could just bring it i could just we could just bring three decks that just did, did dunk on old him right like the thing is if i bring is there three decks to dunk on old him then yeah of like course. that's the question right i mean there's definitely two <laughs> there's definitely two and i'm sure i could find a third that's the thing um my my issue with bringing a chain or potentially a briar um is like i just i have to think about because those are going to really struggle into these old these type of old decks most likely um you know channel malhero can potentially go uh go tall enough but chain i feel like chain is going to probably struggle against this old deck um Maybe I've seen it tested more, but I like Reinar. Like I like I like Reinar's Reinar into old him. I like I love Kano into old him. I think it's literally a buy. Um, <laughs> quote me here as I lose a match on yeah. on camera to old him or something at the tournament. Um, <coughs> but yeah, I mean Lexi is really powerful too. Um, is it powerful enough? Is it better than the Rune Blades? I'm not sure yet. And then I don't know about Dash. I'm not gonna. I don't think I'd play Aggro Dash. Uh, but potentially i saw like there's like the pistol aggro the one that maybe utilizes items a bit more that's an option but i'm really looking at like uh yeah lock in today old him ryan arcano i think i don't know if i'm bringing a rune blade but maybe mm, i just need to test okay. a little bit more if i bring a rune blade yeah. i feel like it's gonna be briar though because like i gotta have some ability to go like if my briar if you know if my two decks that are let's say they theoretically have buys and old him that's really good but then if if my third deck that has a rough matchup in the old him gets paired into it like i want there to be some ability to beat it and uh, maybe i have to test chain more but it seems like chain is going to have a pretty hard time against like particularly those kind of like the the winner's old him deck where it's like briar you know landing a nice channel mouth heroic maybe with like a force of nature should be able to go uh go over it that's not let me let me throw this back at you though only one person on your team each round can play into ultim so your other decks need to be good against whatever else is in the format, whether it be aggro decks, whether it be a wizard, whether mm -hmm. it be a Rhino, whatever it is. You only get to play Ultim one of one of the three seats each round. So even if if you're, all your decks are trying to prey on just Ultim, you need to do more than that. You still need to be able to beat. You know, people are going to bring aggro decks, people are going to bring bring blades, people are going to bring wizards, people are going to bring brutes. Like there's yeah. a lot of you know. Even I, if you say that yeah, we think eighty percent of teams are going to have an Ultim on there. Cool. But what's the rest of the team doing? <laughs> yeah, so I left out... You need out, to win two out of three matches. You're right. So I left out some details, and that's that, you know, I also think that those other two decks are kind of the best deck in the format. Reinar into Rune Blades, it's like... Uh, it can be a little bit hard, I guess. But um, okay. you have game to win. You have, like, you have tons of game to win. I def I've been playing Rhino. Crossrap is a big nerf. Yes, it's Losing a, I, is a I was big about nerf. yeah, I was about to say that. I've been testing a lot of Rhino recently actually and Jesus Christ, that losing Crossrap sucks, but I also roll I roll an unusual amount of ones. So, um, I don't know why you're rolling dice. 
Because I got freaking the bark bone strapping. What do you mean? Okay, well, that's fine then. Oh my god, this guy thinks I'm rolling scabbies. You're about to you're about to roast me, but um, yeah, like I, I really like the I like Reinhardt and Kano into the entire meta. To be honest, I just think that them against Ultim is very favorable. So I, there's a lot there, there's a lot to there's a lot to test and to figure out. We're very early days here, but um, yeah, I mean that that's my trinity. The Rune Blades are sort of you know they're the uh, the the fourth and fifth place that might come back up. All right, so those are the decks we're looking at right now, obviously early in testing. I haven't played a lot of things, to be honest. There's so many things I want to explore. Um, I think there's ways to even take Ultim in different directions. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you want to talk about from a deck perspective, or do you want to move on to, I guess, talking about team events rather than Blitz? <laughs> anything else you want to cover on Blitz in terms of the metagame? No, I think that really sums up Blitz. Like, the Blitz format right now, what we're thinking, um, and just, like, recapping... recapping the data that we have right now because i i think that you know I, I don't think the data represents the potential format that you're going to be running into in these these events but we don't, we don't really have data like the, the data is literally just the battle hardened that's where, what i'm saying that that is i mean it's pretty right. i mean that's that's data right that's a big tournament there's a lot of Very people small. yeah it's, it's one big tournament though right and that's kind of the thing is what i'm saying is that in a week one of an event you just pick the best thing that does the one thing you think does the the best thing into the format and, and that's what people did and i think very very wisely so but my next point would be that we don't have like the week two data we don't have week three data like week two data is literally going to be the calling <laughs> for sure and you're preaching to the church on that one like i, I wouldn't bring any church. yeah i wouldn't bring any of those the the decks that were in that top eight i don't think but i know that a lot of people in preparation for these tournaments are gonna, like they're gonna look for a baseline and that's where they're gonna look um oh. So I think, right, yeah. and rightly so. Like that is the place, but I guess it just means that you know there's, there's other things happening, and you've got three seats at a team event. Let's we let you forget. Yes. So Hayden, how do you win a team event? What's the most important? What's how do you what what is important, right? Because it's it's different than an individual event. And I want to quickly mention this: it's less important, but from a deck building and deck discovery perspective, you know, testing, I think mm -hmm. that right now it is less important than it is in any other event to sort of like find a broken deck or like some sort of non-interactive combo. It'd be ideal, yes, but I think it would behoove you to have players on your team get more reps, be comfortable, understand the meta, and have solid game plans going into the tournament. Yeah, I mean, the first of all, I think the first place is I was like, what is a team event, right? Mm -hmm. So if people aren't familiar of, of how team events work, we haven't really had them in Flesh and Blood before, so it's, it's really new. But effectively, you have yourself and two others. You're going to sit... Uh, side by side so three of you on one side of the table three on the other side of the table you're gonna each person's gonna play a match each person's gonna play a game and it's best of three of those games so basically the first team to win two games uh, you can play the third game if you want to i think but you you don't need to especially in a, an event like the calling where you probably want to save your time and go and get some food or chill out um, but that is how team events work and effectively so the team that wins two two games wins the wins the round and you know, gets to the point, effectively gets the, the, the W on the match slip. Um, you can communicate between your teammates, which is, is really cool. It's a really cool feature of, of team events. So you can talk about, you know, you can ask your, your teammate for advice. Um, you can finish your match and sit at the table and, and help your teammates. You can't touch the cards. That's a big thing. Don't be touching your teammates' cards. They have to do the, the decisions autonomously. But in terms of you can be there to support and, um, and help them with decisions and give them advice, <clears throat> which is a thing I really like about team events. So that's why seeding is really important. I think we'll talk about seeding in a minute. Uh, what else about a team event? Yes, you have to have three different heroes uh, mm -hmm. for the splits calling, but you can have the same cards in the deck. So you could play a Ko and a Reinar, and you could both you know both players can have Gambler's Giles, both players can have um, Beast Within's, whatever, etc. Like cause there's no limit on there's no unified. If you've played other team events, there's this thing called unified where you can only have cards in one deck. It's not it's not the same. So. That is, that is a team event. We haven't really had it before. We've had some sealed events. We've had some blitz side events, but this is the first time that we're going to have a proper, you know, with like some some marbles on the line. There's some PTIs on the line. There's cash on the line. There's gold foils on the line for the top four. So it's top four teams at the end of this calling that go into the single elimination to then semifinals and final to determine the winner of, the, of each of these three team blitz callings. So that is what team blitz calling is. We were talking about, I guess, how do you win them, right? What are the fundamentals? Well, some of the main fundamentals are the fact that you want to try and pick you want to try and pick decks that are going to be good into what you think other teams are going to play. So we just talked about before. If you think that every team, 80% of the teams are going to have uh, an ultim, right? Then you know that you, you know, someone each round is probably going to play an ultim. 
so now you start to think about okay well, like well that's a that's a target we think that every team's going to have at least one aggro deck maybe two aggro decks okay now we, we have a target right we have an understanding of what we want to try and do in this format and that's the, the way to start really in terms of picking your decks and trying to work out your team composition i think those things are pretty important and then there's like a lot of things with you know like seeding where you seat players and where you seat decks brendan but i can i can hold off on that if there's anything else you want to talk about first no, I'm actually interested to hear about the seeding because I've never played a team event. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so if you've never played a team event, and I, I'm fortunate that in, in Magic I've played a number of team events, and one of the most important things I think is the seeding of your... There's two things, the seeding of your players and the seeding of the decks. So the first thing is seeding of players. And one of the more traditional things to do is like put your strongest player in the middle, the player that can give advice to the left and the right hand players through the event. Um, because if you sit in the middle, obviously you can turn either way during the game and give advice. So generally the kind of like thought process is you want the middle player to be like your strongest fundamental player, the player that can give some attention and, and time to the players left and right for some advice. So they understand the decks that the other two are playing as well, ideally, and probably understand the meta and most of the heroes in the in the format so they can sort of glance over, see that, you know, Genus Watchund is sitting on the other side of the table and they know what's going on uh, and how to help their teammates sort of make a decision on, on what sort of strategy or line to go on, for instance, or what equipment to flip over in that matchup. So you want your, you know, generally want your person in the middle to be the most knowledgeable in, in general um, from a player base. And then you can, you know, you can afford to have your left and right, maybe just be like specialists in their deck and just like sit there and just like know their deck inside and out and just like do the thing they need to do. The other thing you can do with your seating is that if you have two stronger players, but maybe a, a player that's newer or you've got a friend that you want to bring into the game, but has only just started to learn, you can actually put them in the middle. And you can have the players on the left and right be experienced and give them the, the knowledge and, and talk to them because now you have two heads helping one head as opposed to if you put the inexperienced player on the right or the left-hand side and they only get the player in the middle to help them. So that's something you can do with the seating. I think is, is really important. You want to understand like basically the makeup of your team first is what you want to understand first. Like where is it probably going to make sense to seat the players first? And then you start to think about where to seat the decks. And what I mean by this is that if we just if we just use the information that we just talked about, so we, we're going to have predominantly stronger players in the middle, right? The players that can help their left and right teammates, the players that um, want to dedicate some time to the left and right. What are they going to do? Are they going to play these long, grindy decks that you know is going to take the whole round and they maybe can't devote as much time to the left and right? Probably not. They're more likely maybe to, to people to put like aggressive decks in the, in the middle that can, you know, they can dedicate some, they can finish the game quickly and then help the left and right or they can like, they can be a little bit less focused because their deck is just like, Slam, charm, out heroic, slam, X, attack, whatever. And they can dedicate some time to the left and right. So that's that's where decks start to come into it as well. So I, I would generally say, like, you think about your team composition, you think about your team seeding, and then you think about where you're going to put decks in relation to your players um, and just kind of what you want to do with your with your team overall. And then, Brendan, then Brendan comes, mm -hmm. like, the last step, which is trying to metagame the seeding, <laughs> <laughs> which is much harder to do. And I would say this is not as important, but it can give you some edges, like, based on all the things we just talked about, well, where are people going to put their decks? If we know that actually the aggro deck is going to be in the middle, does that change where we want to put our like controlly grindy deck? Does it change where we want to put our kind of like our wizard, our our brute? We think, you know, on the left-hand side, people are going to put their controlly grindy deck, so we put our brute over there, whatever it is. So that's that's the kind of the next step. But the main things I would say are like your player composition, your, where you want to put your teammates so that they get the best, it's sort of possible, I guess, head start. You know, they get the best possible um, ability to, to succeed. And then as well with the decks after that. Really interesting. <laughs> it's, I, I love team performance. I think they're super, super interesting. I think there's a lot of gamesmanship. I think it's fun. You get to communicate. You get to enjoy the experience of a tournament as a team. And one of the things about Blitz, right, is that it's a, a reasonably variance format, right? You get best two out of three. So, yeah, oh, my opponent, you, you should have seen it. They just like, they just like Sonic. I tapped out. They Sonic boomed me into Wildfire and to like played a Tome into a Sonic Boom. You know, I died on turn one. Man, that doesn't happen very often, but it happened. Oh, good. We've got two more matches to play here that actually are worth something. <laughs> so, do you th would my opponents, would, would the opposing team, do you think they would ever try to deceive me? Would they ever say things that are not true to make me, th to make me think that they, oh. they're doing things or have things that they don't? Oh, they definitely could. I mean, that's something that you could do. I mean, that's, that's like gamesmanship and stuff, and it's not something that like... I'm big on, but a friend of the show and, uh, you know, teammate of mine for Sydney calling Damakai is, is known to do that from time to time, you know, to, you know, uh, and, and I remember in Magic often he'd point to a basic land and be like, just hold this counter spell for next turn, you know. <laughs> uh. And what's the fab equivalent? Uh, 
uh oh i think like if i mean you, just put like, the razor in arsenal dude like exactly, it's not it's, it's only damage yeah, just save the razor reflex you have the go you so, have go again yeah. like it's only yeah. damage <laughs> yeah you can put the reckless swing into arsenal here rather than pitch yeah. it yeah oh my god uh you definitely can i mean it's whatever like uh, to be honest i don't pay any mind to what my opponents are doing in a team event other than maybe like what they're doing with like moving the cards around in their hand to like what they're thinking about playing i don't listen to what they're saying though Unless I think that, uh, genuinely, I, d I don't, because even if I think that they're not as knowledgeable, uh, that I'm not sure that I would agree with the play or whatever. I just I just tend to, like, tune out a little bit and just focus on what I'm doing and focus on the, the board state and the game state and maybe what my teammates are doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's going to be so fun. Um, all right, Hayden, anything as we kind of close out here that you want to touch on before we get to, oh, man, a review section? <laughs> um. No, I, I think just like team, if you're thinking about playing the team event, but you maybe you don't have a team, like reach out on Discord servers, on the Facebook um, pages, maybe like the fan page or competitive hub or like a, a dis there's Discord channels for the events, like for Madrid, for Las Vegas and for Sydney, reach out and just say, you know, you're looking for a team, you play these decks, like people will be looking for specialists as well if they have a really good idea of like the kind of heroes they want. Get in and play. Like even if it's playing with people that you don't necessarily know as well, great opportunity to make some friends, great opportunity to meet some new people um and just it's blitz is fun right and i mean these events like it's yeah it's a calling but like at the end of the day it's not you know it's not that high stakes it's a good opportunity to play there's the uprising premiere on the friday which is going to be awesome um and yeah like like team events are awesome team events rock and you get to do it in blitz which is also a bit more low-key a bit more fun so just recommend if you're kind of on the fence about doing it just just do it and um yeah look forward to seeing people in sydney all right, so we're going to head into our review section. We held a little contest last pod, and um, oh, you did, didn't you? Yeah. Why do you think there was so much participation? There was a I lot about that. There was a lot more participation than I expected, and wow, we are going to have some content for a while because there are some hilarious reviews. But um, I'm about to read our winner. But before I do, Hayden, tell the people how they can get their review potentially read out on the Arsenal Pass yeah, podcast. Definitely. I mean, first of all, thank you to everyone who's been giving us uh, reviews and submitting reviews for the podcast. It really helps us get out to to other people and, and be, you know, ranked on like uh, the the kind of what's the the categories listings and things like that. And um, you know, we we love what we do and we love that people listen to it. And uh, so the reviews just help us get out to to more people. And there's been some amazing reviews. If you do want to get your reviews in, you can uh, submit them to ratethispodcast.com for slash Arsenal Pass. It's just basically uh, it pulls. The, it basically makes it easy to leave a review because you can choose whatever service you want to leave it on. It's, it's really easy to do it through Rate This Podcast, which is why we use it. Um, and then also sends us the review directly so that we can uh, we can read the, some of them out on the show. So if you do want to get your review in, as I say, <coughs> ratethispodcast.com forward slash Arsenal Pass. Get them in. But Brendan, who's the winner? And what are they winning? Remind me. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're winning whatever I said they were winning last week. I also... Um, I think it's yeah. a Matt and some Heralds, right? It's so definitely... Sure yeah, it's, you are this, it's definitely a Matt. If you are this person, get in touch with Brendan. Uh, either drop us your email address in the comments below or email us at arsenalpassfab at gmail.com so that we can hook you up with the prize. Yep. Or DM me on Twitter. It's always really easy. But yeah. All right, so I'm gonna <clears throat> try to perform this one because it's. Oh gosh, here we go. <laughs> oh yeah, first of all, the winner I'm is. Mute uh, my mic. <laughs> the winner is uh, 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 Smanger CS. I really hope that 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 name doesn't mean something bad in like a different language or something. I always get so scared with these, and now because I say that, somebody's gonna somebody's gonna get me. Um, but here we go. Love the content these guys put out, but may have to avoid them for a little. Hmm. A bad review. I've been out of the TCG game for a little over a decade, so I've been learning, uh, have been leaning into all the resources available online. I stumbled across this podcast and enjoyed it. With all the knowledge I gathered, I packed my bags and headed to New Jersey this past weekend in hopes of reaching the pinnacle of flesh and blood uh, glory through the calling. Saturday arrives and I'm eager to get started by getting through the first game and getting the jitters out of the way. Announcement on the PA. Pairings are up. I log into Gem and see that I'm paired with Brendan Patrick in round one. Take a screenshot, send it to my friends, letting them know, letting them know that I'm playing Fab Royalty. My phone is flooded with words of encouragement as I make my way to the table. I get to the table and sure enough, it's him, the dude from Arsenal Pass. Everyone around me notices him too. Even the judge is a little excited. So I pull out my Starbo deck and he pulls out his Kano deck. We start the game. We played a very tight game. 
I'd been ahead all game, not taking unnecessary damage, disrupting with Heart of Ice, Arcane Barrier 3, Channel Lake Frigid. I came prepared. Even with him healing, even with him healing 10 for, with two tums, two tum of Fendals, I may pull off the win. Getting him down to one health, I'm at 11. Cards in hand. Just need to close this game out. Start by activating Heart. He's been, uh, he's providing no response to me all game. Just letting them resolve. I'm here, <clears throat> I'm hoping for more of the same, but he says, I'll respond. <laughs> Crap. Can he kill me here? He starts counting and mumbling to himself with the fervor of a hungry kid at a pizza party doing the math to ensure that they get the most slices possible while feigning that they, that they care enough about the others to share. I see it I see it in his eyes. He thinks he has it. For a split second, I feel like he, he even mumbles. AB3 won't save you here. He pulls off the killing turn. Once it's all said and done, I th I even think he licks his fingers as he's as as if he's satisfied his hunger. The rest of the day is a blur. Everything just reminds me of that whisper. AB3 won't save you here. At night I have nightmares. AB3 won't save you here. I started to break, I've started to break up, uh, break up anything that is alphabetized. The letters A and B can be together. Everything is just a subtle taunt. AB3 won't save you here. Hayden, since you're, since you seem like the more compassionate one, oh. I need some sort of, I need some sort of resolution to get past this. I've upped my tier on Patreon in hopes of getting your attention. Please help. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for the review. Uh, Brendan, please be kinder when you're you're playing people at events. You know, stop licking your fingers. It's just it's just unsavory. It's a little bit unclean as well, to be honest. So let's just cut that out. Um, any, I guess I'm the compassionate one. Yeah, I feel for you. I, I'll make sure that Brendan uh, behaves himself in matches at callings more often. But um, you know, it sounds like you had a, a very close match. So that's what we like to see. Hard advice doing some work until oof, until it didn't anymore. So. God, he really hooked me with that one. When I was reading that, it was like it was like um, I think it was like eleven thirty p.m. and I was just in bed and I saw the notif I saw this like notification, or I was, uh, or I think I was listening to a podcast. And I was like, yeah, I'll go see what the Arsenal Pass thing looks like on this because I was using the Apple one. Um, and then this is the first one I see, and I'm like, I, s I read the first line. I was like, love the content. I may have to avoid them for a little. I was like, oh shit. I was like, what is this? <laughs> right? Yeah, what have I said this time? And he's talking about game one. He's going through it, you know, getting paired. I'm like, oh, what did I do this guy? I don't remember. And then I'm reading through it. I'm like, this like third paragraph. I'm like, the <laughs> it just gets ridiculous. I was just dying laughing. Um, but yeah. I have a favorite review. We're going to have to get that on the pod next week uh, from that's been submitted. So I think I'll, I'll have to give out some heroes to that person as well. <laughs> But yes, if you if you are the uh, unfortunate round one pairing of Brendan who submitted this, do make sure to get in touch with your contact details so that uh, Brendan can organize your prize. <laughs> all right, Brendan. Yep. That's uh, that's going to do it for this week's pod. You know, we've talked all things Blitz. We've talked all things team calling. We did a bit of a deep dive unexpected on, I guess, polarized matchups and the health of design space in the game. And I know you've got a big pod lined up next week to basically talk about you know, this idea of possibly a rotating format. You know, I don't want to give too much away, but that's where we're headed next week. We've got a big pod. I think we have a guest maybe even joining us for that discussion. Is that is that right? We do. do the, wanna, the, no? the doctor is coming in. It's going to be Mr. Tarek Patel. Mr. Nick Nackabricker Brack himself coming on Arsenal Pass. Um, but yeah, this is going to be a bit of a more curated one because I feel like when you're approaching the subject, although we just did it in this podcast without it being curated and probably sounded like idiots, I think it's important to really do your research, look at the history, and really break down and kind of analyze the game. Um, again, it's it's it'll be an opinion piece, so it's conversational. You know, we're not either right or wrong, but um, I think it'll be an interesting topic. Maybe, maybe. Awesome. Well, other than that, if you uh, are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do so. Go check out all the videos we have up there. We're just pumping up some, um, pumping up, putting up some deck techs up there. We've just done the Kano one from the PT. Uh, Dash will be dropping later on today or overnight. And then as well, you have our cyborg guys up on Patreon. Massive thank you to all of our patrons. Uh, if you do want to join our Patreon, you can find us on patreon.com forward slash Arsenal Pass, uh, where we do additional monthly podcasts. We do cyborg guides that go along with the deck text that we put up. We do uh, analysis videos and deep dives, all those kind of nice, juicy things. And uh, other than that, yeah, we're both on Twitter. You can find us, Brendan APG and Fian underscore Dale for myself. Come talk all things fab. We post up, you know, events that we go to, the deck list that we're playing, just talk fab stuff in general. Brendan likes to shit post a little bit. I do occasionally. Um, Is that what you call? I really, I just, 
I I, I put I mean, a lot of effort into that stuff. Uh, this stuff, I, it's very. I know cur- you do. It's very curated content. Uh, um, I mean, it is. <laughs> but otherwise, just massive thank you. That's been episode fifty nine of Arsenal Pass. We will see you next week. Bye.